Tonight, a Canadian professor convicted on terror charges in France. A new layer in a long legal saga. Insisting he's innocent, a second extradition now hangs over Hassan Diab. We will uh, look carefully at uh, next steps. Decades after a synagogue bombing. Head coach Nick Nurse bounced from the Raptors. Maybe a roster change could have been better than, uh, than firing him. A new game plan for the former NBA champs. This year wasn't us. I think everybody saw that. And when the kindness of strangers goes the distance. It was my best marathon experience ever. Two runners and an unforgettable gift at the finish line. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina. Reporting tonight, Heather Wright. Good evening. A Canadian man who has maintained his innocence for decades was sentenced to life in prison today by a French court. Hassan Diab was tried in absentia for the 1980 bombing of a Paris synagogue, a blast that killed four people and injured more than 40. His lawyers say he was in Lebanon at the time of the attack. While an arrest warrant has been issued, it's not clear whether Canada will comply with any possible extradition request from France. CTV's Glenn McGregor starts us off. 42 years have passed since the bombing of a Paris synagogue killed four and injured dozens. Now, from France's highest court, a finding of guilt against Hassan Diab, an Ottawa University lecturer who has steadfastly claimed he was in Beirut at the time of the attack. He learned by text message today he's been sentenced to life in prison, time he will serve only if Canada agrees to send him back to France Again, uh, obviously, uh, we will uh, look carefully at uh, next steps at what uh, the French government chooses to do, what the French tribunals choose to do. Uh, but we will always be there to stand up for Canadians and their rights. At France's request, Diab was first charged in 2008 with the bombing. And after a lengthy legal battle, he was extradited in 2014, even though a Canadian judge found the preliminary case hypothetical and based on conjecture. Diab spent three years in Paris's notorious Fleury prison before an investigating judge found the handwriting evidence against Diab was flimsy. He was released and returned to Ottawa. French prosecutors appealed, winning the right to bring Diab to trial, leading to his conviction today. A group of Ottawa supporters released a statement calling the legal process a nightmare, overwhelming cruelty and injustice. Canada must make it absolutely clear that no second request for the extradition of Dr. Diab will be accepted. Justice Minister David Lametti said in a statement it would be inappropriate to speculate on extradition. But Diab's supporters are imploring him to use his discretion to end the ordeal. He can shut this down right at the outset, or he could launch extradition proceedings that will keep Dr. Diab and his family trapped in this Kafkaesque maze of injustice. Because he was tried in absentia, Diab has no avenue of appeal of today's verdict under French law. If he's extradited, he will spend the rest of his life behind bars. Heather. Glenn McGregor in Ottawa tonight. Two men are in critical condition after their small plane crashed into two houses south of Montreal. The small aircraft hit a home in a rural area of saint Remy before striking a hydro wire, then crashing into another home. The victims, both in their 30s, were rushed to hospital in life-threatening condition. No one in either home was injured. Quebec Provincial Police and Canada's Transportation Safety Board are investigating. Police remain tight-lipped about the theft of more than $20 million worth of gold and other valuable goods from Toronto's International Airport. And as CTV's Heather Butts reports, there are more questions than answers as to how a heist like this happened in the first place. As police probe how $20 million worth of gold and valuable items vanished from Canada's busiest airport, CTV News has learned Air Canada's cargo operations were handling the container when it went missing. A source familiar with the investigation says the goods were offloaded from an Air Canada plane that landed at Pearson Airport Monday evening. Aviation experts say about a dozen people would know the exact contents of a shipment, including the flight deck and loading agents, all under non-disclosure agreements. Airline security would know about this uh, and they would, in fact, clear uh, procedures to maintain security uh, of that traffic. It is called valuable air freight for a reason uh, and typically 
um, the, the shipper would in fact sign waivers. Information that's provided for secure transport. Whether you need armed guards uh, at the ground. The airport authority claims the thieves access the public side of a warehouse that is leased to a third party. Air Canada said it has no information to provide directing media to local police. A lot of the finer details I'm just not able to provide because I want to solve this. Solving the heist that has captured international headlines involves a number of police and border agencies. Somebody just didn't pick uh, some sort of big package or container and say there's something valuable in that I think we'll take. It. So it's not a, not a ma and pot type break in or theft undoubtedly organized crime group of some sort with inside information. There are hundreds of security cameras in and around the airport, though police have not released any surveillance footage or suspect information. Heather. Quite the story. Thanks for this, Heather. We're learning more details on the investment we told you about last night between Ottawa and European automaker Volkswagen to build what could be the largest EV battery plant in the world. Today, they made it official. We put up a lot of money, money that's going to come back in investments in economic activity very quickly. Congratulations from our side for outperforming the competition and bringing this gigafactory to St. Thomas. That wasn't easy. Volkswagen is spending $7 billion to help build the plant in St. Thomas, Ontario, which would create 3,000 direct and 30,000 indirect jobs. The federal government is committing $700 million and up to $13 billion more in subsidies, while Ontario adds $500 million. Construction will start next year with battery production slated for 2027. Three days into a strike by Canada's public service workers, questions are being raised about the level of support the union had from its members before walking out. The Federal Labour Board says only one-third of PSAC members actually cast a ballot, and the board has flagged what it calls irregularities with the strike vote. CTV's Judy Trin has those details. A massive labour disruption across Canada. More than 120,000 public servants showing solidarity. Unbelievable what this community is doing! But now it turns out the majority did not cast a ballot. I wasn't able to vote. Oh, I, never got, I never got any information. Problems arose when PSAC shortened the vote deadline. The union didn't have up-to-date email addresses for thousands of people. Workers couldn't log on to its website. That led to one employee taking PSAC to court. A federal labor board found that 42,400 employees, or only 35%, voted. Still, the board determined these major irregularities would not have changed the outcome. I was very surprised that only a small amount of PSAC workers voted, but um, we can see that the solidarity is there. I wouldn't feel right going into work and all these people are, are fighting for my raise, for my money, for my rights. The union says 80% support the strike, while the government says it's still at the table. We are putting all of our efforts and I'm confident that we will get to a competitive and fair uh, deal for public servants. Today, PSAC blinked after soldiers at military bases in Petawawa, Winnipeg and Halifax were left out in the cold. The majority of the buildings on base, we did lose heat and hot water uh, and currently that applies to uh, the approximately 700 members that we have living in here on base. After the Canadian forces complained, the union agreed to make heating plant workers essential. Although PSAC says it has overwhelming support from its members, it is paying workers $75 a day to strike. And Heather, public servants can't collect unless they show up on the picket line. All right, Judy Trin in Ottawa. Thanks, Judy. A Russian warplane accidentally dropped a bomb on its own city late Thursday, injuring three people and damaging several buildings. The late night explosion left a crater roughly 20 meters wide in the city of Belgorod, about 20 kilometers north of the Ukrainian border. Security footage shows the moment the explosive hit the street, a blast so strong it launched a car onto the roof of a nearby building. There are new clues tonight into the mind of the mass shooter who opened fire inside a Louisville bank earlier this month. Police sources say the 25-year-old left behind notes with distressing reasons behind the rampage. Here, CTV's Los Angeles Bureau Chief, Tom Walters. God, don't have an angle. It has been 11 days since a mass shooting in a Louisville, Kentucky bank. 
Before he was killed by police, 25-year-old Connor Sturgeon murdered five of his co-workers. Everybody wants to know why. Police have still not disclosed a motive. He left a note. But law enforcement sources are now saying that one of Sturgeon's goals was to show how easy it is for the mentally ill to buy assault weapons. According to his family, Sturgeon did have mental health challenges, but there were never any warning signs. And police say he was able to get an assault rifle just a week before the shooting. He purchased the weapon legally. Gun violence, as a protest against access to guns, may seem like twisted logic. But mass shootings are irrational, which is why Kentucky's governor was already calling for red flag laws to take guns away from the mentally ill. At least take a step so that we can intervene when we know somebody's about to go out and murder a whole bunch of people. But it's hard to know that. Even as she called 911 during the shooting, Sturgeon's own mother didn't know the danger her son posed or that he had bought a gun. He's nonviolent. Mm -hmm. He's never done anything. Please. Okay, and you don't believe he owns guns? I know he doesn't own any guns. Now, in addition to lost lives, a recent study shows gun violence taking a heavy emotional toll. Just after the bloodshed in Uvalde, Texas, calls to crisis lines mentioning guns rose dramatically. So while mental illness contributes to mass shootings, there's a sign that mass shootings may be contributing to mental illness. Heather? All right, thanks for this, Tom. American women will have continued access to a widely used abortion pill after the U.S. Supreme Court blocked lower court rulings restricting it. Mifepristone has been safely prescribed for two decades and is used in more than half of all abortions in the U.S. Today's decision is being seen as a victory for abortion rights as appeals play out in the courts. The Toronto Raptors have fired head coach Nick Nurse, the man who led the club to its first and only NBA title. But after a rocky season, team president Masai Ujiri said today the organization is in need of a reset. CTV's John Benavalli Rao has the latest. The head coach of your Toronto Raptors, Nick Nurse! In his time in Toronto, it certainly was a highlight. Nick Nurse among those being celebrated after his team won its first NBA championship. And the contrast with today couldn't be more striking. Today we uh, decided to part ways with uh, coach Nick Nurse. We want to wish Nick Nurse and his family um, the best of luck. After weeks of speculation about Nurse's future, the team's president, Masai Ujiri, confirming he'd been dumped, saying the Raptors were in need of a culture change. This year wasn't us. I think everybody saw that. Nurse joined the team a decade ago, starting as an assistant coach. And in his first season as head coach, the team won that NBA title, a moment drawing the country together. Nurse was also called upon to coach the Canadian men's national team. That's really cool. And in 2020, he was named NBA Coach of the Year. But the Raptors have since fallen short of expectations, this past season finishing ninth in the Eastern Conference, though Ujiri not blaming Nurse alone. No, I'm not surprised by it. You know, with the what the way we were playing and the record we had, uh, you know, something was going to happen. And it's very sad. Fans expressing a similar sentiment. It was a tough season to watch, so change needed to be made. Yeah, I know it is a little bit sad. It's a sad day, I'm sure, for most Toronto fans. Last month, Nurse made comments that further fueled speculation he might go. But asked about it last week, the 55-year-old said this. I love it here, and we've built a really strong culture. A coach has a certain shelf life. They're like a bag of milk. And at a certain point, they are going to expire. At some point, players are going to start to tune you out. Ujiri says the decision wasn't easy, but necessary to reset the team. He says other changes are coming and hopes to name a new head coach before the start of summer. John Benavelli Rao, CTV News, Toronto. Coming up, a maritime fish fight. That was really scary to witness. The profitable eel industry and the problem with poachers. Plus, a trapped bobcat and a wild rescue. Complaints of violence and rampant overfishing by poachers has led the federal government to shut down a lucrative baby eel fishery in the Maritimes. That decision now being challenged in court. 
CTV's Kreisen Ashkate explains. Yep, every night since March 24th, um, we've been seeing activity and people down at the mouth of the river here. Anne and David Gagnon have made Hubbards their home for more than a decade. It's usually quiet here during the spring, but they say this year there has been an increase of unusual activity. We noticed that there were license plates that were covered and that there were several people uh, moving around with full balaclava. Those people are fishing for elvers or glass eels, currently migrating from the ocean and moving into rivers in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. A lucrative market for illegal fishing, as just one kilogram of elvers can sell up to $5,000 in Asia. Gagnon says since that 911 call, there has been little to no enforcement. And just last week, RCMP say a man was assaulted with a metal pipe during a late night altercation among harvesters. It's like the wild, wild west of like the gold rush or something. Like it's just been very disheartening. Canada's fisheries minister Joyce Murray has now halted all elver fishing, citing safety and conservation concerns from unauthorized harvesters, including threats made towards conservation officers. This all comes down to mismanagement by DFO, and they should have been able to see this coming. This lawyer who represents authorized elver fishermen says his clients are taking the department's decision to court to get it overturned. It's devastating for them. They've lost millions of dollars. Their employees will not have enough insurable hours to qualify for employment insurance benefits. Gagnon says not only does she want her community safer, she also worries about this at-risk species. If they've disappeared in Asia and Europe, are we next? Kristen Ajkate, CTV News, Hubbards, Nova Scotia. Police in Wisconsin responded to an unusual call when a driver reported a wildcat was inside his car and wouldn't get out. When officers arrived, they found a furious bobcat caught in the vehicle's grill, making removal a challenge. Yeah, I got him. A wildlife warden was able to wrangle the enormous cat out of the grill and into his truck. The animal was later released back into the wild. Still ahead, the street fight on Parliament Hill. What to do with Wellington. The site of one of Canada's most controversial protests is the source of more political tension tonight. The federal government and Ottawa are fighting over the future of Wellington Street. CTV's Annie Bergeron-Oliver explains. Wellington Street is getting a facelift with new bike lanes and streetlights. But the changes are part of a reopening plan the city of Ottawa and the federal government can't agree on. I'd like to see it as a, like as a walking path. It's a road, it was built for cars. Some green space, park space would be really nice. Wellington Street has been closed to traffic since trucks blocked access during the Freedom Convoy. That event spurred a renewed discussion about whether the street should close permanently. For security reasons, the federal government wants to buy a section of the street near Parliament Hill from the city of Ottawa and transfer the land into federal jurisdiction. If for no other reason, blockading and closing off that uh, Wellington Street and only allowing access if and when you require it is the best security measure you could take. Most all of them. Ottawa's mayor says he's open to selling Wellington, but says that until a full-fledged plan is presented, the city street needs to be open, and that will happen in about a week. We're happy to continue conversations with the federal government about the future of the street, but those conversations could take some time. And during the interim, we have to run a city and we have to get people moving in and out of downtown Ottawa, so the road needs to be open. The mayor says nothing is permanent. For Jason Commandant, who owns a business on a nearby pedestrian mall, the uncertainty is a challenge. After repeated closures due to COVID and the convoy, he wants clarity to plan for his future. The street being opened to both cars and cyclists, I think, is the right move to make until they can make a comprehensive plan and really understand holistically how they're going to bring this street back to life. The city is currently conducting an internal audit and traffic study around the implications of transferring the street to the federal government. Until that is done, the mayor says the city won't consider giving up ownership. 
Annie Bergeron Oliver, CTV News, Ottawa. Members of the royal family are paying tribute to the late Queen Elizabeth II on what would have been her 97th birthday. The Prince and Princess of Wales released this never-before-seen picture of the Queen with some of her grandchildren and great-grandchildren. It was taken last summer at Balmoral. And the royal family also shared this photo of Elizabeth, noting her incredible life and legacy. After the break, a stranger's selflessness at the Boston Marathon. When a first-time marathoner qualified for the Boston Marathon by raising thousands for charity, little did she know that she would be on the receiving end of generosity at the finish line. As CTV's Allison Hurst reports, a Toronto runner was behind the random act of kindness. It's right there. Kevin Kernock had already crossed the finish line, but returned with his partner Kate Brown to cheer for the final runners. We cheered them on, went for dinner, came back, and as we came back, we saw one final runner coming up Boylston. That runner was Taylor Savage, yes! running her first marathon after qualifying for Boston by raising more than $10,000 for charity. The race organizers were taking away the barricades, breaking down the stands, even taking down the finish line. And this woman was putting one foot in front of the other. She wasn't even running kind of in a, like she was hurting kind of way. She was running with like just such fierce determination. Savage bounded across the finish line roughly eight hours after the start, but race officials had stopped giving out medals. The Boston Athletic Association says they'd run out and the rest will be mailed next week. Crossing the finish line at the Boston Marathon was my mission. I told myself at the beginning of the race, I will finish. One of my biggest fears was actually not receiving a medal. That fear was never realized because Kernock gave her his. I went up to her and said, um, did you get a medal? And she confirmed that she didn't. And so I said, um, well, you deserve this. So I took the medal from around my neck and gave it to her. It's not just a medal. It, it goes beyond that. They chose to cheer for me. They don't even know who I am. I mean, he he trained for that as well. You know, he, he ran the marathon just like I did. Everyone shared some hugs and congratulations before going their separate ways. Her family hugged us and said, how do you know Taylor? And Kevin said, we don't. We're just so inspired by her. This was Kernock's 12th marathon and the second time he'd run Boston. This was my worst time ever, and yet it was my best marathon experience ever because of everything that happened afterwards. That has had a lasting effect on Savage. There just needs to be more Kevins in the world. Allison Hurst, CTV News, Toronto. Such kindness. That is it for us tonight. I'm Heather Wright. For Omar and all of us at CTV National News, thank you for watching. Sandy will be here tomorrow. Good night and have a great weekend.